direction of the democratic view. My name is Phyllis Italiano. I'm the hostess. Been doing it a long time. And with me today, I have a man who I would say, from the tip of my toes to my hair follicles, I have a great respect for. And that's our council person and environmental lawyer, Jeff Bragman. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Good to be here. I've been doing it a long time, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It seems like these things never end. Well, <laughs> this is not the show to talk about things ending, because yeah. my term is ending, but. Your term is ending, but My term is ending in on. January, but I will still continue yes. doing what I've always done. Okay, one of the things that we were interested in discussing a little bit about was our airport. Now, I know from having introduced and talked to many environmental people uh, that Suffolk County has the worst air quality of any county in New York State, and that is a fact. Mm. And that's that I didn't hear. That is something that uh, we have to think about when we talk about something like the airport. Well, we, you know, there has been uh, a lot of concern about, uh, you know, pollutants from aircraft. Basically, a lot, lot of the people that were concerned about the, the airport were concerned about air quality that was being damaged by the flight of aircraft. And that's, it's uh, somewhat hard to detect, um, you know, particle pollution in the air. Uh, and what the town did uh, to investigate maybe a bigger issue was we retained an expert uh, who did an analysis on what impact on our overall carbon emissions the airport had and that because that was uh, you know we thought that was sort of uh, congruent with our policy of trying to get renewable energy going in East Hampton and to try to be a renewable energy community and in, and in fact the town of East Hampton enacted a declaration that every decision we make every single governmental decision that we make um, had to be sort of passed through the filter of our renewable energy goals. So, and we got some interesting results from the study that we, uh, uh, from the expert that we engaged to do the study. Um, the carbon emissions from jets, the, the private jets that you see coming in, coming in and out, are pretty astonishing. I mean, they're really, they drop tons of carbon in the air, you know, minute by minute, tons, literally tons. And when you think that many of the private jets that land in East Hampton uh, disembark two passengers or one passenger. It's not uncommon. And they not only do they fly in, they fly out and return generally. Most of the jets don't sit around uh, for the entire time. A lot of the corporate people send them off to do other business. And the study, I'm doing this from memory because I didn't, I didn't check this today, but I, as I recall, um, the estimates that our consultant came up with was that uh, were that um, aircraft contributed, the airport as a whole contributed, I think, something like 6% of our overall uh, carbon footprint of the town. And when you think about the fact that the airport serves probably less than 1% of the population, that's a pretty disparate impact. It's a pretty big impact. So we know that that's um, a problem. And uh, it's obviously, I think, one of the big uh, drivers in making a policy decision about what you want to do with the airport, because it's a really large uh, greenhouse gas emitter. And it's doing it for a very small, you know, small percentage of the population. Uh, it's not like Route 27, which is also generating a huge amount of carbon uh, emissions, but it's also serving millions of drivers that are coming in and out. This airport serves a very small portion of our population. I, mean, I, I can't go anywhere when I don't eventually have to get on 27. Well, that's true. That's true. It's one of the reasons it would be hard to measure uh, air quality right there because the airport is, you know, relative to what's going on on the highway. 
there, there's going to be more carbon emissions that are attributable to cars. But I'm not sure that that, that that doesn't answer the question about whether the airport is environmentally sensitive. I think the larger question is, you know, for the number of people that it serves, what is its negative impact on our renewable energy goals? And it's, it's significant. Airplanes are, you know, they're not terribly efficient machines. They're getting, getting better, but uh, they're not. And um, given the emphasis that the town has on renewable energy, that's certainly a significant factor. You know, so the, the airport really probably, you know, the issues that it presents are, you know, safety, the environment, uh, you know, including uh, uh, carbon emissions, um, and uh, quality of life impact. You know, the, the noise impact is... Uh, uh, and also the water quality. And water quality is, is a concern. CFOA. Well, be, because the we had uh, pollution from these perfluorinated chemicals, which they, they now call forever chemicals, because they're, um, they never, the bond that creates them... They never break down. They never break down. Yes. And it's a very dangerous uh, compound to have in a water supply system because people are ingesting the water. And that, that the airport, you know, if we knew in the 1940s what we know now about uh, preserving our water supply, we never would have put an airport there. And I do think another, you know, significant negative of the airport is we're storing thousands, tens of thousands of gallons of fuel there. And, you know, it's, we have an up-to-date facility there, but it's it's still, if the worst happened and we had a spill, it's really one of the worst uh, locations uh, for that kind of impact because it parts of that property um, recharge into the deepest aquifer. Um, generally, we only have one aquifer, but there there's another very deep aquifer underneath that uh, there are three layers in, actually in the to the aquifer in, in we have we have two we, are, we only have two of yeah, them here yeah. and but that that the deeper aquifer does underlie parts of that airport and if you contaminate that you're you're in that's a very serious uh, danger it's a that's really i mean we water is life on the east end of long island and if we can if we contaminate the mogafi aquifer which is the deeper one we're we're in serious trouble so storing tens of thousands of gallons of fuel on the airport site is, you know, it's not ideal. So, so why is there a question if it can be such a threat to the life of the people who live here? Why was there even a question about continuing with this airport? With the airport, well. The airport, um, there's a lot of contention about whether the airport is or is not an economic driver for the town of East Hampton. I th and I think part of it is people see, you know, very uh, well-known people, you know, flying in and flying out. Um, these are celebrities. Um, they're, you know, captains of industry. And people have sort of an assumption that in some way this is... Uh, I'm going <laughs> to use a controversial term, trickling down and, and driving, you know, our day-to-day -day economy. So we commissioned a, a pretty serious study, and I, I have to say actually a pretty readable study. Um, most economic studies, I think, would just put you to sleep. Um, this company uh, called HRA, very well known in the field, and actually, they wrote a very uh, uh, easy, easy to digest report, and it, it, it basically said that the airport uh, drives, you know, a portion of the economy, but a very, very small portion compared, you know, to the total uh, economy of the town of East Hampton, which is, you know, up in the ninety million dollar range. And again, it, it drives, you know, maybe, you know, I think again, I'm doing these numbers from memory, I, 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 if this were a town board meeting, I would have had them on the tips of my fingers. But I think, again, it was about 1% of the economy. It was not a huge driver. There are some jobs that would be lost, but not as many. Uh, you know, I've seen signs out on the streets saying, you know, save 400 jobs. That, it, that's, not, that's not an accurate term. And um, 
Interestingly, recently we did an, uh, an update, or I should say an, an addendum to the economic study, and one of the scenarios that they posed was very, very similar, almost identical to what I had proposed as a plan for this coming season at the airport, which was to pause uh, commercial traffic and to pause corporate traffic. And the HRNA did a study uh, of that uh, possibility. And um, interestingly, their conclusion was that it would make really a negligible difference to our economy, um, largely because we've done some um, uh, questionnaires for arriving passengers, like enough we did a fairly good, got a fairly good number of responses, like I think it was nearly 400 responses to a carefully designed questionnaire. And um, uh, a very large percentage of, I think, first of all, there are like 60 or percent or more of the people own houses out here. So it's very unlikely that they would stop coming to East Hampton. And a very large percentage of the um, uh, the persons who answered the questionnaire indicated that if they could not use an airport to access East Hampton, they would nonetheless continue to come by other means of transportation. So when they took all the numbers and you know shook them up and and spilled them out, the difference between you know the, our economy with the airport and our economy without the airport in terms of spending and direct and indirect expenses that come out was negligibly different. That would not have a significant uh, difference. And I, I took some pleasure in reading that because the supervisor had made a very strong point that my proposal to pause corporate traffic and pause uh, commercial traffic was reckless and dangerous. And it's like, well, really not so much. Doesn't seem that way. <laughs> and then another impact um, that that people don't talk about that much from the airport is safety. Because over the last two decades, uh, particularly helicopters, uh, have had a mechanism where if the weather is inclement and it's basically instrument rated weather, um, they have, the, this airport has allowed pilots who are not instrument ra rated to fly in under the cloud level under a, uh, a policy called special VFR, uh, VFR's visual flight rules. And that is what caused a huge amount of noise, and you may notice that uh, for a while when, when days are cloudy, that a lot of the helicopters come in under the clouds because they were permitted to do that using this special VFR. And not only is it noisy and intrusive, it's dangerous because they're very low and there's no, there's no room to... Uh, 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 to correct if something goes wrong with the flight. And it's dangerous because their the pilots are, uh, I remember reading a report on it and they were talking about um, CFIT. Uh, CFIT, uh, one of the experts was saying, well, the danger of using this kind of, you know, uh, permission to fly under the clouds is a CFIT. I said, what is that? And he said, it's controlled flight into terrain. I mean, I said, oh, you mean crash? And he goes, yeah, crash. So they're saying the risk of using special VFR is they're so busy looking at the clouds up that they sometimes, although the aircraft is under control, they forget and they crash. And it's, so it's dangerous. So you've got, you know, the environmental impacts, you've got the safety impacts, you've got, you know, the global warming impacts, and you've got the quality of life noise impacts balanced against the economic you know, driver that it is because it carries, you know, tourists and long-term residents who use it, you know, into our town to shop. And, and because it pleases the people who have the means. Well, there's no doubt it does please the people that have the means. And uh, those people want to continue, you know, they want to continue what they have. The, you know, uh, and I have to say, I... I um, sort of separate out in this discussion the small plane pilots in East Hampton. Um, you know, I've been in East Hampton for m more than 35 years, and when, uh, you know, I remember the airport uh, when it was not as capable an airport. It's expanded. 
and it can handle much you know, bigger jets. And um, it was never really a problem as far as I was concerned. It sort of fit in, you know, it was a rural community. It was kind of a rural, small town airport. But that's not what it is anymore. If you drive, you know, drive by on Thanksgiving or drive by on any of the summer holidays, you see these jets. These are large jets. Um, and, um, and the jets are a problem. They're not, it's, you know, everyone likes to say, well, the jets are much quieter. They've gotten much quieter. They have. They have indeed gotten quieter. But they're pretty noisy when they land and they take off, you know. So, and those quality of life complaints uh, are not limited to East Hampton. They're, uh, you know, we have, you know, heartbreaking stories from people in Noyak, um, Riverhead, North Haven, Sag Harbor, Orient Point, and points west. Um, and people are, you know, saying, you're ruining my life. I mean, I have a helicopter every minute flying over especially on the North Fork, because they adjusted some of the routes. We didn't, but the, you know, the, uh, uh, the FAA okayed you know, routes, and the North Fork has gotten hit. And we've had, uh, we've had a, uh, a councilman from the town of Southampton come in and say, you know, you, you got to stop this, because we don't really get much benefit, if any, from your airport, and our residents are getting killed with noise impacts, and it's a real problem. Um, but you know we're at a decision point now. This is the first time in decades, really, literally decades, that we actually will have the power to make this airport whatever we want it to be, and um, that you know is an opportunity uh, to have real vision about what the future could be. And so I, I do think, you know, there's a tendency among elected officials to sort of you know, try to strike the middle balance, you, you know, please as many people on both sides of the issue as you can. Um, and that may be, you know, that just may be what the reality is of politics. I don't know. But to me, it seems like it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for um, political courage and vision. And um, whether we get that or not, I'm, I'm not sure. Give me a break. I'm not sure we're going to get that. <laughs> I, I will say, you know, I, I, and I want to say, in case anybody does wind up watching the show, uh, that you know we can easily have access for um, a, a medevac helicopters without the whole airport That's complex right. that we have. Um, first of all, they they can and do land other places other than airports, and they do that a lot. But also, you know, all you need is one cleared area where medevacs can land. And the second emergency issue that people raise is, well, what if we had like a 1938 hurricane, really bad hurricane? And the answer there is that, you know, the, the big supplies, if, if we were really in trouble, they're going to be flying much larger cargo planes west of us into West Hampton. And then helicopters, if it's possible, if the weather permit permitted, um, you know, as I said, could land and, you know, deep, you know, unload supplies as they needed without running a major airport. So I don't think that emergency, uh, you know, service is a, is a particularly strong reason to maintain the airport. Um, the real question, the thing that isn't really getting a lot of uh, examination is the, there are some interesting possibilities if, if that airport we're not an airport. I mean, for example, we could have an outdoor amphitheater there, you know, for large-scale events. We could have land there that we could use uh, for uh, solar. Um, although the, the, the airport property itself is environmentally sensitive, you don't want to be cutting down a lot of trees and vegetation, but, you know, there's probably, particularly if there were no airport, there's ample room for, uh, for, sol for solar arrays. Um, and when you think about it, it's 600 acres, so it's almost, you know, it's almost like a central park for East Hampton. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of. Didn't realize it was 600 acres. 600 acres, you know. Wow. Yeah, it's a big, big piece of land. And you know, when you weigh and balance who benefits and and who gets hurt right now, uh, the balance is heavily against airport users, because it's a tiny number of people, and the impacts are large. But 
you know, there, you know, I think there's a tendency, as I said, to compromise and, okay, yeah, I'll listen to you a little bit, I'll listen to you a little bit, and we'll take the middle course. And, you know, you know I would hope that the town board um, really recognize that this is a turning point where, you know, we're talking about the future. Um, and, you know, we should really contemplate very seriously that this could be a huge change for East Hampton. And I have to mention, because a lot of the pro airport people do mention it, and it's true that technology is moving forward. And it's likely we're going to get electric helicopters or electric uh, vertical takeoff uh, aircraft. Um, but, you know, when and if that happens, I think we could adjust. And if, it, if they were really quiet and we liked the idea, you know, um, it, it, it could probably be accommodated. But not sure that maintaining the airport as is and having you know, big jets flying in and out and having our carbon footprint, you know, being so heavily impacted is really, you know, the most rational, progressive, you know, uh, way forward here. You know, but it's going to take, it takes some real thought and, and I got to say it again, it, it's going to take political courage. I mean, we're a small town board. I don't know well, really. Courage, what a phrase that is. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't, you First know. of all, also, there is a large airport not far from us, Grabeski. Yeah, People true. can go to, there, to that airport if they really must fly. You know, I mean, there is no reason for this airport to be. There just is no reason. I have to mention one other thing because I, I skipped over it, and it's an important thing, and that is that Montauk it was in an uproar right before the election because they're saying they don't want the problem that we have. They do not want noisy helicopters disturbing their peace and quiet. I think that's a good thing. I don't blame them. Because it, it means they share the same concerns. And what I tried to say while I was running for re-election was, you know, we're one town, we have one problem, and there's one solution for, for everybody. Um, so I do think the solution has to work for everybody. And one of the good benefits of temporarily shutting down the airport and opening it up and uh, following my plan, which was to stop commercial traffic and to stop corporate traffic, is that once we have control of the airport, we can adjust the traffic so that if we saw Montauk getting hit with diverted traffic, um, we could adjust and open up so that we took some of the pressure off Montauk. I'm skeptical that Montauk will get hit as heavily as the people who were energizing that issue we're, we're saying it would get. Um, and unfortunately, ironically, they're, they're the p same people that were getting people very scared about more helicopters, they were wearing buttons with silhouettes of helicopters with a red slash, yet they invited to the rally that I went to where I got heckled and couldn't speak, they invited the CEO of Blade Helicopter to speak, and they applauded this man who is largely causing the problems we're experiencing. So the, what I saw from the Montauk uproar was they were channeling that fear into closing, keeping the airport open. And that's something that's not acceptable to anybody because it's clear to everybody from the process that we followed that m an overwhelming majority of people in the, in the town of East Hampton recognize that it can't continue as it has been. But there are a lot of gradations between you know, keeping it as is and closing it. There are a lot of permutations, uh, different kinds of airports that we could have. But it just seems to me we should really view this as an opportunity to sort of grasp the future. So what are we going to do? What do you think is going to happen? I think less is going to happen than I'd like to see happen. I, I, I'm wondering if the town board will be uh, as bold as I think we need to be. I think the number one thing we need to do is we have to give people who are noise affected, safety affected, and all of us who are affected by the carbon emissions um, a real respite. I mean, we really have to take action that dramatically makes a difference in the quality of life for people who live here, whether they come in and out or whether they've been here for generations. Anybody who calls this place home, whether it's a second home or whatever, is entitled, I think, to a real uh, a change that returns us to the um, tranquility that is really the hallmark 
of East Hampton has been. And the safety, and the water quality, yes. and yes. the air quality. So it's what you drink, what you breathe. Yes, yes. That uh, this airport is going to affect. And, we and need the water to think quality, about yes. that. And as I said, I you know, <laughs> we we all drink from the same well. That's right. And we're all getting that water from underneath our feet. And when you know when you have contaminants like these perfluorinated chemicals, um, it's it's a hazard for everybody. And it, this is a national problem. So. So what do you think? How is this going to finally end? And when is it going to end? Well, I don't think they want to decide until the new year, that's for sure, when they have a new board. Um, you know, there's been talk of curfews. That's not going to be adequate. The, 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 the problem here is that in order to solve this problem, even in a, in a moderate way, you, you have to reduce the quantity of traffic coming into that airport, and you have to reduce the quantity of the noisiest traffic. That generally means the helicopters and the jets. And when you do that, there, you know, no one can know, there's no perfect knowledge about what will happen. So you have to be able to monitor it in real time and adjust to make sure that Montauk's not getting hit. Okay, Jeff, I'm leaving it up to you to do it because that <laughs> is what needs to happen. And we need you to be the voice of the people because the people want to live in clean air with clean water. Otherwise, and peace and quiet, tranquility. And, uh, well, peace and quiet is part of, of clean air. I mean, if you can't drink the water, yeah, what you have yeah. is nothing. Well, remember that. <laughs> I'm sure I'll have an opportunity to speak when, when and if we see the new town board uh, acting on it. And I hope they act. You know, that's where that's where the rubber meets the road. The, the, you know, well, I that's what we're going to wait for. Thank you so much for giving us all of your thoughts because we need them. This is an important, important issue.